Hello students, in this video series, I am going to discuss about stability and frequency response chapter. So there will be three major topics that will be covered in this video series in a way that topic one would lead to topic two and that would again give some lead to topic number three. So I want you to go in series from one to two and then to three in order to appreciate the essence of this topic. Let me list the topic here. The first topic that we are going to discuss is the time response and the frequency response. Where we are going to study the behavior of a system in both time domain and frequency domain. This is going to be purely a revision of what we have learned in the lower semesters but still I would it would be worth to watch as it gives some insight to the next topic which is nothing but the body plot and the negative feedback systems as a continuation of our first topic we are going to carry the frequency response concept onto the body plot first I might spend some time talking about how to plot them first and then uh, we will be discussing about how these concepts could be applied to negative feedback systems and check the stability of the system. If during this check, if we found that the system is unstable, then we need some mechanism to bring back the system to stable. And this will be the concept that will be discussed in the next topic, which is nothing but frequency compensation techniques where we'll be focusing on different techniques to bring back our system back to stability. In this video, I'm going to focus on the first topic that is the time and frequency response. And uh, out of that, I'll first focus on time response first and then later on I'll be focusing on frequency response later in a second part of the first topic. We know from network theory, the time response of any system could be uh, split into transient or the natural response. So this is my time response and this time response of any system could be split into two parts. Okay, So one of the uh, part is nothing but it's termed as natural response or transient response. I generally prefer to use this natural response and the other part is nothing but the steady state response. Let me quickly review what, what are those two components and uh, what exactly I have stated here with a first order system and then later on we'll be carrying out these two concepts into a second order system. So consider an RC a network which is a, a simple first order system where I will have a resistance and a capacitance that is connected between the output node and the ground and the resistance is basically connected between the input and the output nodes. So let me try to write the output expression of this in terms of S domain. So what I can write is the output in terms of S domain could be written as a product of the input in S domain and the transfer function in the S domain. So let us try to compute what is the transfer function of that. So so it, it becomes pretty clear like the H of S could be evaluated once if I know what is the output divided by the input. Now the output is nothing but the voltage drop across the capacitor and that could be written as current multiplied with the impedance of the capacitor whereas the input is basically the drop across both the resistance as well as the capacitance so it's the same current but there are two components in its impedance path so which is nothing but the capacitor and the resistance now after rearranging all these uh, things we would end up with something like 1 upon 1 plus s times rc here we should note uh, like this particular expression could also be written in a standard form which would help us to give some insight which I can write it as 1 upon 
RC divided by S plus 1 upon RC. And clearly, this transfer function, which is nothing but the, uh, the system transfer function, has a pole in it. And the location of the pole could be derived by equating this e denominator polynomial to 0 and then trying to identify the pole location. And we would end up with something like minus 1 by RC. And we know that the product of RC has a special name in it, which is nothing but the time constant. So we can even write it in terms of the time constant form. Now, again, let me uh, convert this RC network into a kind of block diagram so that uh, it would be more generic when we try to discuss. So I'm just going to model this RC network with a, a block which has a transfer function of tau inverse divided by 1 plus tau inverse. And the input is is basically the S domain input and the output is also an S domain output. So all of these terms that I've represented is all with respect to S domain. Now let us try to plot the S plane for the above system. The system pole, when I try to plot in an S plane would appear in the left hand side of my S plane that will across my real axis somewhere over here. So this is the pole location and and this is what is the corresponding S plane for the system. So what have I plot is with respect to system transfer function. Now let us analyze the step response of this system by applying a step input. Now we know a step input is nothing but in terms of time domain could be represented with a kind of waveform. So this is with respect to time t and the voltage at the input, which is denoted like this. And we know that this step response is a, is a signal which will be equal to zero till the time equal to zero. And the moment the time is greater than zero, there will be a step. And I'm going to assume that the maximum magnitude or the magnitude of this particular VI is around one so that it makes my computation pretty simple. So let us convert this, like this is my time domain response and the equivalent yes domain signal could be returned as I of S when I perform a Laplace transform would end up with one upon S. So now let us try to compute the output expression in terms of S domain, which is nothing but, it's going to be a product of the input and the transfer function. So our input has one upon S term and the system has a transfer function, which is tau inverse divided by the pole, which is located at the negative value of tau inverse. Now we know that uh, this could be multiplied and when we do uh, a kind of partial fraction method, we can split these two terms and we can write it something like this, which I do it fast. That is A divided by S and B divided by S plus tau inverse. And the whole thing is being multiplied with tau inverse. So I have two expressions, one on the left hand side, the other one is on the right hand side. I can cancel out some of the common terms which are there and where tau inverse could be canceled out. And when we and doing this partial fraction method, uh, we, we just try to cross multiply the terms that I have and then the denominator will again have a product of S into S plus tau inverse. So again, I can cancel out the common terms or of these two expressions and, and finally I would end up with an expression which would look something like this. Uh, now that I have to evaluate the coefficients of a and b and it's pretty, pretty simple task so I'm not going to do and show how it is but what I would end up is is having those values to be equal to tau for a coefficient and minus tau for b coefficient and the output expression would be given v o of s is equal to tau inverse into tau divided by s where I have replaced the term a with plus tau whereas the b term is replaced with minus tau 
and I could can cancel out these common terms and that would lead to 1 upon s minus 1 upon s plus tau inverse and now when we translate this expression into time domain we need what is known as an inverse Laplace transform so trying to apply an inverse Laplace transform so which I write it as i dot l dot t I can write this 1 upon s would directly map to a value of 1 and what happens to this 1 upon s plus tau inverse so we know from math it is equal to the exponential of minus t tau inverse and this is what the output expression and to be more generic I can write the magnitude of my input which is represented by v in of t so as I've discussed earlier this particular output expression or in general any time response could be decomposed into first or steady state response the natural or transient response so I'm just going to write right with those notions in mind where v of, to, v of t is nothing but the forced response plus the natural response now the question here is which are the terms that would map on to the forced response category and which is the term that would map to natural response now we know from the definition of natural response it's a, it's, it's a kind of term that would get decayed or gets died out after a particular period of time and the term that corresponds to that category is basically to, belongs to this e to the power minus t tau inverse term as we know as the time extends over a period of time say for example if the time being uh, been extended over a period of time the exponential becomes more of negative term so e to the power minus infinity would basically lead to a zero which means that as the time progresses this particular term would get died out and that is what has been represented by the natural response and when it comes to the f to the uh, forced response or steady state response the one is the one that maps to my forced response now let us visualize uh, this output expression in terms of time domain and then uh, try to get what exactly I'm conveying here so again I'm just trying to draw my input with respect to the time which is nothing but a step input and the output is basically with respect to again with respect to the time v o of t and now this time the output will take a kind of path that looks something like this and here's the final value and this value would be equal to 1 since because my v in of oh, v i is basically taken as a magnitude of 1 okay. so the final value of this particular circuit will also be 1 now as I said this total time or this total output expression could be split into two parts now that could be visualized as something like this part is denoted by v n of t and these the remaining part could be represented by v f of t now the question is you might ask like why did we use a step response rather than uh, any other input signals like sine or cosine we know from Fourier theorem in particular from Fourier series that a step input is basically built uh, using uh, a summation of cosines and sine signals of infinite frequencies with varying magnitude uh, in order to prove that statement I'll just try to show you a video which would help you to visualize what I've stated here a periodic waveform is one that has a shape which is repeated at regular intervals of time or periods. To illustrate how the Fourier series may be used to represent complex waveforms, let's first apply a single sine wave to a square wave with period t. To construct a sine wave with the same period, we draw a vector and rotate it one revolution per period. The vertical projection of the vector tip oscillates up and down once for each revolution of the vector. 
When the projection moves to the right at a uniform rate, it draws a sine wave. To estimate how well the sine wave represents the square wave, we can superimpose one on the other. The approximation is only fair. The error is about 19%. Next, we try the same fundamental, or first harmonic, and the third harmonic. If we stop the action momentarily and add the vectors, the sum produces a waveform. which obviously is a better representation of the square wave than was the first harmonic alone. How much better is shown by the superposition test. The error is about one half as large as before. When three harmonics, the first, the third, and the fifth are added, The resultant waveform is an even better representation. If we again superimpose, we find the error now down to about 7%. Hope this video gave us a clear picture that a square wave or any periodic signal can be constructed as a summation of cosine and sine terms of different frequencies but covering all almost all the infinite frequencies ranges and with different magnitudes here in our case since a step input is a part of a square wave it is equally represented by uh, an infinite summation of sine and cosine terms of different frequencies and magnitudes here. And that is the reason why we went for a step input so that we can excise all the frequencies that are involved in this particular signal. Uh, I have a second question. Um, how do we make this system brisk? In a sense, how to reduce this component Vn of t that is nothing but the natural response so that I can re I can go back to the final state at the earliest. Uh, probably to answer this question, we need to know about frequency response. I know that I have not yet formally described anything about uh, frequency response yet, but let me try to give some insight with the hope that some of the terms that I'm going to use would be fairly known to you from the lower semesters. The first term that I'm going to talk is the bandwidth. I'm going to show you how this particular term bandwidth is related to, to the system pole and then uh, later how will I answer that the question of having this Vn of t to be closer to the value of zero. In general, from control systems, we define the bandwidth of the system as the magnitude of the system pole that is closer to the origin. Uh, I want to emphasize on a particular word. The bandwidth is basically related to what is termed as the magnitude of the system transfer function pole. Okay, So I'm talking about the system pole here and not the input pole. Let us revisit the S-plane with an example to show how this, these two terms, bandwidth and the system pole, are related to each other. Consider uh, the following transfer function which contains uh, a, a single zero and a single pole. The pole is located at the negative uh, real axis at minus five 
and we know that the zero would generally be denoted with a circle and that is located at minus two here and this is the s line that i've drawn for the transfer function okay that is my with respect to the system that i've drawn and now let us apply a step input and uh, to see the output response more analytically. And we know that the step input vi of s could be represented as one upon s. And how would we visualize this step input again with, with, with respect to the same s plane? So what I've drawn here is basically an s plane and this s plane belongs to the system transfer function. Now, is there, is there any possibility of doing the same kind of s plane for this uh, input? Of course, here we could visualize the term one upon s is nothing but a pole at zero. So which could be written as again with an s plane with j omega here and then sigma here. And right now for this input signal, I have a pole that is located exactly at zero here. And this is with respect to the input signal. Now let me draw the block diagram and now the output expression in the S plane could be written as VO of S that is nothing but it's going to be a product of the input and the transfer function which is H of S and that would lead to an expression which is the 1 upon S from the input and a 0 and a, and a pole from the system transfer function. Now, after doing, I'm not going to do the trans, uh, like the partial fraction method here to simplify this expression, but I can just show you after performing the partial fraction, the output voltage in S domain could be represented as two by five upon S plus three by five divided by S plus five. Clearly, the above output expression indicates that the first term has a pole but where exactly the pole is located? It is basically located at origin, indicating that there is a kind of relation that it makes with respect to an input signal. Even we know that this input signal has a pole exactly at zero, and even the first term has the same type of relation. Now let us move on to the second term here. Clearly, there happens to be a pole at minus five, and this particular minus five, we have already seen that even our system has a pole at minus five. So in a similar argument, I can state a two important results from this particular expression. One, the poles, I'll just take one more page here. The poles of the input signal and there is again the poles of the system transfer function. Okay, So these are the two poles that I have automatically added to the output expression here. Now let me try to apply my inverse Laplace transform and uh, visualize like what exactly these terms are. So we know this 1 upon s would be mapped to 1 and since because there is a, an enumerator whose value is 2 by 5, this would be 2 by 5 here and the second part of the expression will map to 3 by 5 times e to the power minus 5t. And we know that this part of the expression or the second part of this particular VO in time domain is nothing but it's a term that is related to the natural response, which means that this particular term would die out once the time progresses in the positive direction. Whereas the 2 by 5 term is going to be the steady state response or it can also be called as the final or force response. And clearly I can state that the poles of the input signal is responsible for forced response at the output and the poles of the system transfer function are basically responsible for the natural response. The second statement clearly indicates the possibility of making the natural response to almost closer to the value of zero. 
Now, as I said, uh, let me just bring it up. Yeah. So as I said, if this exponential term is of large magnitude, which means that instead of phi, what happens if I have 10? So the rate at which uh, the natural response would decay would be much faster. So in a sense, like if I could able to bring or move this particular pole all the way further away from this origin and uh, 10 or to any extreme extent, what happens is the exponential term will have a larger value in it. And as the time increases, the larger term would create a greater impact and that would lead to a faster decay rate of our natural response. But still, as I stated earlier, I have to correlate this with my bandwidth. Now, we know with respect to this example, we had a pole which is located at minus five. And I just want to relate that with respect to the bandwidth. So as I stated earlier, the bandwidth of any system could be related to the magnitude of the system pole that is closer to the origin. And if there is a case, I have to take the magnitude of it where I have a pole which has only the real term. So which when we square it and there is no imaginary term, so which would be a zero and that would lead to phi. So this particular term, let us put them in a frequency magnitude response kera and then see how to visualize them. So this is my system transfer function, which is H of J omega. And then here is my omega term, which is the frequency scale. And what happens is at this particular bandwidth, that is omega BW, which is nothing but it is equal to five in our present case. Now till this particular frequency, the magnitude of the system response would be constant. But the moment I cross this particular omega bandwidth, what happens is the magnitude of my system would get degraded at a rate which is defined as minus 20 dB per decade. You might ask like, anyhow, I have already stated how to reduce the value of V and of T, but still why I have to relate the tau or the pole from the system to the bandwidth. Uh, so in order to explain why I'm talking about the frequency response in this context, uh, for that, I'll just try to represent our block signal here. We know that the input V i of S is a step input, which has an infinite frequencies. And that when it passed through this particular circuit, which is H of S, or whatever the frequencies that falls within this part of my frequency will be outputted directly to my V of S. Okay. But what happens to the higher frequencies, the frequencies that falls after this? The magnitude of those frequency would be reduced or it might go even to a value of zero. And and what happens to the output signal in, in, a, in, a, in a sense like how do I visualize that having a signal with low frequency. A step, as I said, this particular step has infinite frequency, but the output has a, only a certain band of frequency in it, and which are all low frequencies. How do I represent them? It is nothing but it's a kind of signal that I would get. So clearly, it is pretty clear that I cannot reproduce the same nature of the signal that I had at the input over to the output because of the bandwidth of the or the limited bandwidth of my system. Now the other way to think around us like how would I make this system brisker or how do I how would I reach the final value at the earliest? So the only way that I can do is is to try to increase the bandwidth to a larger value. So that is how moving the pole to the most negative scale or moving the bandwidth to a higher value has got their correlation between them. We have an important parameter in the first order system pole, uh, which is nothing but one upon tau. And this one upon tau has a special name, which is termed as exponential frequency. 
and we generally represent this particular term with alpha. Using that, we can formally define two timing characteristics in time domain. Namely, the first one is the rise time. This is nothing but a measure of time for the output to reach to, from 10% to 90% of its final value. And the second important uh, timing characteristics is nothing but the settling time. So which is again, is a measurement of time at the output to reach the final value with some tolerance. So usually the tolerance value would be around 5% or 2% depends on uh, the, the system requirement. So what I really want to convey here is both these timing parameters could be defined in terms of the alpha factor. But anyhow, I'm not going to show the derivation here. I will leave it to you so that you can just go through that. But I would rather show you the waveform by stating what I have stated as the timing characteristics. So as I stated, the rise time is nothing but it is a time for the output to start and to settle down with respect to time okay so from 10 percent to the 90 percent of its final value so this time is generated as rise time and what is meant by uh, settling time say for example i have a magnitude of one that is the final value and within five percent which means that how long the output signal took to reach around 0.95 voltage. So that time period is denoted as the settling time. Okay. So, so probably you would have already learned all of these concepts in your signals and systems, but still it is worthwhile to mention it here. Now let us turn our focus on the second order system. And as one can guess, from the first order system, uh, this will obviously contain two important parameters in a similar way that we had talked right now of the term alpha here. So in the case of second order system, system, there will be two terms. So as we had for the first order system, we had a single term which defined these two timing parameters in, in, in a similar way in the case of second order system, we have two important parameters, which is labeled as natural frequency, which is usually denoted as omega n. The second one is nothing but the damping factor. So which we normally represent with the symbol zeta. So these two terms in turn defines four timing characteristics. It also defines four types of timing response. And, and I'm talking those four responses or those timing responses with respect to the natural response. Okay, um, so those are basically related to the natural response, not to the forced or, or the steady state response. Now, first, let me write a general uh, second order system before I talk about what are the four timing characteristics that can I can I can derive from these two parameters or the other way around, like the four different type of output response, in particular, the natural response. Okay, so let me first write a general second order system transfer function, which normally has a kind of structure where the denominator polynomial will have an order of two. Here, I'm going to prove how the value of natural frequency and the damping factors have come. I only give the final result here. Interested students can uh, refer to a textbook which is termed as control system engineering. Uh, by Norman 
is nice. So this is, this is a pretty good textbook for those control systems. Okay, so now that as I stated, I'm just going to define directly based on this transfer function, the natural frequency omega n could be returned as root of b, whereas the zeta, which is nothing but the damping factor, which is basically defined as the exponential frequency divided by the natural frequency. So the exponential frequency is a term that we, we talked earlier when we talked about first order system divided by the natural frequency, which is nothing but omega n. And that is equal to the, the, the a, that is nothing but the factor a that I've represented in the second order polynomial divided by two. And the whole thing is divided by this omega n. And I can state the value of a using all of these terms as twice that of zeta times omega n. So it doesn't matter like if you're if you're not understanding how all of these terms has come. But the point here is I can rewrite this Hachoffis transfer function using these two parameters. So omega n square divided by s square and then two times that of zeta omega n plus omega n square here. And from this denominator polynomial, we can derive the poles. And we know that how to get the terms. I'm just going to write, rewrite those poles in terms of the natural frequency and the damping factor. And we have studied from network theory that based on the positions of these poles, uh, there will be four different types of uh, output response. Uh, one is termed as over damped. And the second one is basically critically damped. The third one is under damped. And the fourth one is and damped. Okay, so all of these things are basically related to the natural uh, part of my output response. And we know that the natural response in general relies on the system pole location. So the first term or damped is basically happens when the system poles are, are basically real terms. Okay, so I just mentioned that P stands for the pole and these are defined with real poles. Okay. Whereas critically damp it also has the real terms in it, but those poles will have the same values. That is both the pole P1 and P2 will have the same pole location. Whereas in the case of over damped, the poles will be real, but the P1 and P2 values will be, or the, the the two pole locations will be totally different. They have different values in it. In the case of under damped, the poles will have both the real as well as the imaginary terms in it, which means that I will have poles which will have complex conjugate pairs. And in the case of last, that is undamped, the poles will have only the imaginary terms in it. Okay, so let me show uh, how the output would respond and how the uh, poles, like I, I try to make a relation between the S spline and the time response and depending on the location of my system poles and this is with respect to system pole. Okay, I'm not talking about the pole from the input. So I'm just going to show the system pole depending on those pole locations, how the time response that is nothing but V out of T would end up. This is an animation and clearly uh, out of the two parameters, one is the uh, natural frequency and the other one is the damping factor. In this case, I'm just going to vary only the damping factor, keeping uh, the omega n a constant. Now I have three type of plots here. One is uh, the step response, that is the transient or the time graph. And the second one is the uh, pole zero map 
and the third one is the Bode plot. Anyhow, we'll not concentrate on this Bode plot right now. We'll just concentrate only on the first two plots, the time response and the uh, pole zero maps. Clearly, uh, I have water vapor response. I have a damping factor which is equal to 1.5 and the poles are exactly on the real axis. So as, as it is here. And when I have these two poles, I have a step response which which takes a longer time for me to reach to the final state. And this increase in time happens just because of this particular pole that is closer to the value to the origin. Now let us try to vary the damping factor. When I try to reduce the damping factor, you could able to see that the poles are getting closer. And again, watch carefully about the step response. The step response will become much faster as we move closer and closer. And uh, you might observe that there is a change in the scale. Uh, I don't know how to modify that. Yeah. So the, the point that I want to make here is when this value is equal to one, the poles are exactly overlapping one upon the other one. So that is termed as critically damped. And now when I try to increase the value of or reduce the value of uh, my zeta value, in that case, the poles has right now become complex conjugate. And under that condition, and when the value of this uh, zeta or the damping factor is less than uh, one upon square root, which is basically 0.707, you will get a nice step response at the output which which is generated here now let us see what happens when i try to reduce down the value which is less than 0 0.707 let me watch for uh, i still not reached that particular value but clearly you could be able to see that there is a change that is happening and the time scale uh, in the x-axis is keep on varying so clearly I have value that is almost closer to 0.7 and you could be able to see that in the case of time response there happens to be a, a kind of peaking some sort of peaking is happening and now let, let me try to reduce down further now what happens the peaking becomes larger in magnitude as I keep reducing it okay I hope uh, the peaking is visible so I'll just move my scale, uh, move the value. And clearly you try to observe even the pole location. The pole still has a real term in it and there is a kind of uh, a damping factor. Okay, So here I have the J omega term which creates a kind of frequency in this particular time response. And again, there is a kind of decay in the frequency axis. It is just because, I think there is something that is happening here, which uh, is because I have moved my scale and my system is not uh, fast enough to respond to those changes. I guess there is some change that is happening. I try to reduce it. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so I, I think the moment I move the mouse over my step response, the graph is getting expanded, I guess. Okay. But uh, the one thing that I want to observe here is like uh, clearly uh, the moment the poles becomes complex conjugate, uh, it uh, it has some uh, frequency along this particular y-axis. And that frequency is reinforced by a kind of uh, wave that you can see under this particular region. Okay, So you can able to see some kind of wave that is happening and that wave has some certain frequency and that frequency is defined by this particular pole. And also the output is not continuously uh, going from positive to negative. After a while it gets settled down. Okay, So that happens just because we have some real term still involved in it. But let us see what happens when this particular pole moves completely into imaginary. So I think you know the result but still let me move it. The moment it goes to a value of zero, you could be able to see that there is a waveform which has a frequency and that frequency is basically defined by this pole location. And there is no, uh, 
it continuously oscillates and there is no decaying which means that you don't have any real term involved when the pole is at completely on the imaginary axis so that completes the uh, the simulation part let me try to switch over to uh, the normal uh, discussion and try to explain them with with a set of neat picture here is the uh, natural response of our second order system so the first one is over damped where we have a kind of wave that looks in the time response and the point here is like since the poles are real in this case i have two different pole locations and these two poles basically creates the exponential part and whatever i'm talking right now is purely on v n of t i'm not talking about the v forced response here okay so what i've stated here is only the natural response and the natural response has two exponential term and we know that if i take one of the term as as sigma 2 the other one is sigma 1 it is just because of my sigma 2 which is closer to the origin it takes a longer time for me to reach the final steady state and the next one is nothing but the critically damped here again i have two poles located at the same place and because of that i the poles are real i will still have this exponential term but this time the response is is bit fair than compared to our over damped condition because the pole which was before at sigma 2 has right now been pushed away from my origin okay. now let us see what happens uh, after this like when i try to vary the value of damping factor so in this case the pole has become complex conjugate where i have a frequency term involved along with my real part so the real part has this value and the imaginary part which, which is basically the omega term which we write it as omega d is related to this value and clearly i have shown in the output uh, characteristic graph there was some kind of peaking that was happening when the pole was under damped so clearly it, it shows some some kind of response over here so there happens to be a peak over my final value and again that peaking happens just because of this omega d term the output basically decays off what happens when these two poles move on to the imaginary axis where it doesn't have any real term so if that is the situation what happens is you will have a continuous oscillation whose frequency is basically defined by these two terms so this is the type of response that i would get uh, when our system has under for under damped response okay and clearly there will be some oscillation just because this oscillation has come just because the pole has some imaginary frequency and you can able to see that the output is getting reduced and reaches my final steady state just because of the real term so there are two terms that are involved the oscillation because of the frequency or the imaginary part and this decaying rate is basically because of the real part of my pole so till now we have related uh, the two terms that is the two important parameters which is basically the natural frequency and the damping factor to four different type of timing characteristics or uh, four different type of uh, natural responses that happens in the output now i'm just going to relate again those two parameters with four timing parameters as i guess we we have done the same even in the case of a first order system where we relate the exponential frequency to two timing parameters that is here we have two different parameters and that basically translates to four timing parameters or characteristics so as you guess the first one is nothing but the rise time as we had before and the second one is nothing but the settling time and the third one is the peak time and the fourth one peak 
over shoot okay so out of this four timing characteristics these two timing parameters will come into picture only when the system is under damped it is only under this under damped condition i will have some kind of peaking at the output and what i really mean by this peak time is nothing but the time at which i have the highest value and the peak overshoot is nothing but the magnitude which is away from the steady state response so this this particular region is is termed as peak overshoot which is nothing but it's not a timing parameter this fourth one uh, whereas the other three parameters are basically related to the time so with that i'll try to complete this uh, timing response part and in the next video we'll just look for the frequency response thank you